This is the sixth video in the Edexcel B3 revision tutorial series. In this video, we will be looking at plant science to include plant products, plant communication, and periodicity and circadian rhythms. So in this video, we will look at how plants defend themselves from pathogens and pests by producing chemicals. We will look at the benefits of periodicity as well as the effect that pests and pathogens can have on human food supply. And then finally, we will look at how plants can communicate with each other and with other organisms and link this to co-evolution. As you may remember from Edexcel B1, many plants produce chemicals to defend themselves against pests. Things like antiseptic products and antibiotic products. We can use these in order to make drugs, to treat human diseases or to relieve pain symptoms. For GCSE, you need to know three examples. The first example is aspirin. Aspirin is made from a chemical found in the leaves and bark of the willow tree. Aspirin is used to treat many types of pain and can also lower fevers. Taxol, on the other hand, is a popular anti-cancer drug and is made from the bark of the Pacific yew tree. It was discovered when scientists were screening loads of plants and looking for potential cancer treatments and this drug was able to be synthesised. The final example is quinine, which comes from the South American cinchona tree. It is used to treat malaria. You should remember from Edexcel B1 that malaria is an infectious disease that is carried by mosquitoes. These defences are very important for plants as lots and lots of crops are lost each year because of pests and insects. We will look later on in this B3 video tutorial series at how we can genetically modify plants in order to be more insect resistant. So there are lots of factors that can affect the availability and price of food. First of all, we have damage by pests. So for example, we can have fruit flies which eat fruit and therefore ruin entire fruit crops. We also get things like slugs and snails which will eat lettuce leaves. Secondly, we have the growth of weeds. Weeds are a plant that you do not want to be growing in that area. So weeds that grow near the plant compete for nutrients in the soil. If the plant gets too few nutrients, it won't grow as well, and the crop yield, that's the amount of crop that you get, will be a lot, lot lower. As we previously saw on the last slide, plants also fight off pathogens. If the plant is infected with a pathogen, some of its energy is taken up by the pathogen. Think about how your energy is used up when you are ill. These pathogens can be bacterial, viral or fungal. As the plant is having to fight off the infection of the pathogen, it means it has less energy that it can use to make useful crops such as apples, wheat or carrots, so the yield that we'll get is much lower. If we end up with a heavy infestation by a pathogen, this can mean a whole field of plants is producing no food at all. Finally, we also have the cost of pesticides. So by spraying pesticides onto your crops, for example, fungicides to kill funguses or insecticides to kill insects, you're having to cut into your profit margin. You could also decide to grow more expensive insect-resistant or disease-resistant plants, but again, this is going to drive up the overall cost of the food as the cost of the raw materials will be higher. Finally, any sort of low crop yield that is caused by weather or by extraneous factors is also going to drive up the price of food for consumers. Many plants and animals show a form of periodicity or circadian rhythms. Periodicity means that you are changing in response to a stimulus. Circadian rhythms looks at the daily life cycles. A classic example of periodicity is photoperiodicity, which is something that plants show. This means that they respond to changes in the length of the day, 
and for example many plants will only flower at the start of the summer season whereas some others will only flower in the autumn. Doing this means that they flower when the right insects for pollination are around. The plants are able to detect the changes in light levels, hence the photo part of photoperiodicity, in order to tell them what the length of the day is like. The length of the day will indicate which season they are in. We will look at some more examples on the next slide. On the other hand, we also have circadian rhythms. These are biological processes that follow a 24-hour cycle. For example, our sleeping patterns. Sleeping patterns are affected by a hormonal reaction to light. This is the hormone melatonin which makes you sleepy. So when it gets dark, you produce more melatonin, meaning that you would be sleepy. And then when it gets lighter, the melatonin levels drop down. Having regular sleeping patterns is very good for your health and helps you to feel awake at the right times. Obviously, the opposite to this would happen in nocturnal animals. The body's production of urine also slows down overnight, with the body releasing more ADH overnight. We looked at ADH in the B3.1 video on osmoregulation. By producing more ADH at night, it means that the night's sleep is not interrupted by the need to go to the toilet. Both of these circadian rhythms are controlled by the body's master clock, which is a group of nerve cells found in the brain. Plants are also able to use circadian rhythms. They have two major ways they do this, the first of which is that they use them to control their stomata. The plant stomata need to be open during the day in order to carry out photosynthesis. So as the light levels increase, the stomata will open. This allows carbon dioxide and oxygen to move in and out of the leaf. At night, when no photosynthesis will be going on, the stomata close back up. So as the light levels decrease, the stomata will close. This prevents water loss from the leaf. Another example of a plant circadian rhythm is with flower opening. So plants respond to the light intensity by opening and closing their flowers at different times of the day. They only need to be open when the creatures that pollinate them are active. For some plants this is during the day and for other plants this is at night if they are pollinated by insects such as moths. A few more examples of the plant photoperiodic response would be as follows. So different seeds from different parts of the world will want to germinate at different times. So seeds of arctic plants will only germinate if the days are very long. This ensures that they germinate in summer when the temperatures are warmest. Other plants will start to grow when the day length gets long. This means that they are far enough from winter in order to grow, so they should avoid frost. And then, as we mentioned previously, some plants will only flower at specific times of the year. Over the next two tutorial videos, we will be looking at animal communication. However, before we move on to that, we first need to look at plant communication. So plants regularly communicate to each other. They do this in a variety of ways, however, they tend to use chemicals. Chemical communication is one of the four main types of communication that we will look at in the B3.8 video. And plants can also use chemicals in order to communicate with other organisms, most noticeably insects. The first way they use this is in order to attract pollinators. So lots of flowers are scented and they release a chemical or a pheromone that is going to attract insects. The insects come to the flower looking for the sugary nectar and while they're there, some of the pollen will get stuck to them. The insect then flies away and carries the pollen to another plant and this causes pollination. Plants can also use chemicals in order to attract insect predators. So some plants will release chemicals into the air when an insect pest is eating them. These chemicals attract the predator insect that feeds on that pest. The predator eats the pest but not the plant, so the predator gets the food and the plant gets rid of the pest. 
Some plants, such as the Venus flytrap and the pitcher plant, take this one step further and release a chemical that attracts insects, meaning that they will then get stuck, allowing the plant to digest them. Finally, some plants will release chemicals that warn other plants in the area if they are under attack. So some plants will have leaves that release these chemicals, these pheromones, into the air if the leaves are being eaten by insects. These chemical signals are then picked up by another leaf on the plant or on a leaf of a plant nearby, causing that leaf to produce chemicals that make the leaf harder to digest. This means that the plant is preparing itself for attack from the pest. These chemical messages that the plant can send are an example of co-evolution. Co-evolution is where two organisms evolve in response to each other. These can either be mutualistic or parasitic relationships. For GCSE, you need to be aware of two examples. The first of these is a mutualistic relationship. This is where plants and their insect pollinators have co-evolved. So it's an advantage for an insect if it can reach the nectar in a particular type of flower that other insects can't get to. For example, this moth and the orchid here. We can see how the orchid shape mirrors the length of the moth's feeding tubule. This relationship is also beneficial for the plant because it means that if only one type of insect can get nectar from its flowers, it increases the chance that that insect will visit other flowers of the same type and therefore can pollinate them. This example of a moth and an orchid is a classic example of this. Secondly, we have a parasitic relationship where the two organisms are trying to kill each other off. So we have plants and insects that eat them. So it's an advantage if a plant can produce nasty chemicals so that most insects can't eat it, this means that it will survive easier. However, it's an advantage for an insect if it can eat a plant that other insects can't get as it has access to more food. Therefore, some insects have evolved to eat poisonous plants. For example, the caterpillars of the cinnabar moth are able to eat ragwort, which is poisonous to most other animals. Therefore, it is the only animal eating this food source, so it cannot be outcompeted. There are many, many more examples of co-evolution, both between plants and animals, as we have seen here, as well as between different species of plants and different species of animals. This concludes today's video tutorial from the Edexcel B3 revision tutorial series. In the next two videos, B3.7 and B3.8, we will be looking at behaviour and communication in animals.